You have led me to the sadness I have carried this pain On the back bruised, nearly broken I'm crying out to you I will sing of your mercy that leads me through valleys of sorrow to rivers of joy. When death, like a gypsy, comes to steal what I love, that I will still look to the heavens, I will still seek your face, but I feel Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you. On behalf of myself, our associate pastor Kathleen Stoles, and the entire congregation here, it's good to see you this morning. I want to share with you just a couple of announcements as we're getting started. Um, so the first thing is, I want to say thank you to everybody who participated in our school supply and our backpack collection. Uh, I think we collected somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 backpacks and with school supplies to go in them, and that supported the neighborhood center in Camden as well as the Interfaith Homeless Outreach Council and uh, the Christian Caring Center. And so we're really grateful for all your help with that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your help. I want to share with you a uh, no, couple notes about schedule over the next couple of weeks. So next Sunday, we're going to have one service, Labor Day weekend, and that's going to be at 10 o'clock. It's going to be in here. So next Sunday, one service, 10 o'clock in here, okay? And that's also true for those who are online as well. Look for us next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And then the following week, uh, September 
September the 8th, we'll go back to our normal schedule. That means 8.15 over in the sanctuary, 9.30 in here, and 11 o'clock again in the sanctuary. So um, over the next two weeks, we're going to be changing schedules around, so just pay attention. Um, and the last, oh, the other thing I want to share about that, which means also as we move back into our regular schedule, that we also have our vocal choirs and our bell choirs starting back up. And so um, if you're interested in taking part in either one of those, uh, there's information that's in the bulletin, and you can find out when they're going to be starting their rehearsals. Last thing is, uh, a couple months ago, we did a, a fun event in partnership with some folks in the community. We did an event in here called Medford Rocks, and we're going to be repeating that again uh, this coming uh, Friday evening. And what this was and is was a, an opportunity for uh, kids in the community to share their musical gifts. And uh, what we saw was some really amazing talent. We had an open mic and then uh, two bands performing. And so we'd love to have your help with that. So if you have some time and you'd like to uh, come out and volunteer with us on a Friday evening, we would love to have your assistance. So if you're interested in that, let me know. And uh, I'll uh, be able to connect you with opportunities in there. So I think that those are all the opportunities, or all the, uh, yeah, all the opportunities I want to share. And so Nate, uh, why don't you uh, lead us? Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody. We're excited to worship with you this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing a few songs together. You guys right? Yeah. Sure. the blood. 
blood make us make us one make us one the will be done make us one one heart one heart with heaven, one mind connected, one body unified. Find us together, now and forever. Jesus be glorified. Make us one. Make us one. You will be done. share peace with one another. Yeah. 
sing holy. In holy, holy, holy. So uh, as we get started this morning, I'll invite the ushers to come around. They have the red attendance pads. And when they pass by, I hope that you'll take some time. Let us know that you've been here. And especially if you're visiting with us, maybe for the first time, I want to say again, a special word of welcome to you. Hope that you'll take some time to share your contact information at the bottom of the page. We'd love to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. And uh, that gives us the opportunity to do that. So we look forward to being able to connect with you. Um, so over the past few weeks, we've been talking about parables and um, as we've been talking about them, these stories that Jesus told to illustrate points about all kinds of things, about what it means to live uh, in the light of God's revelation, um, we've really tried to address them in ways that it's not just kind of going through and explaining what this means, but really to try to bring them back to the place where they originally would have been for the people who heard them for the first time. And that means trying to bring that back, that element of surprise and shock, and so that's why we've called this Truth Bombs, and I think that you'll uh, continue to see that maybe today, I hope, if I did my job properly. But one of the things that is surprising about today, and it's one of the parables that I don't know that we look at a whole lot, and it's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And actually one of the commentaries that I read talked about this as, really it should be titled the parable of the eccentric employer. And I think that you'll see why that makes sense uh, in just a little bit. But as we continue now, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Kathleen to lead our, uh, do our children's time. Or do you want, how, how are we doing this today? Need, what do you want to do? Need, uh, so this is children of all ages. I need you to come up today. Um, I need like nine volunteers. Wow. All right. Okay, so kids. Adults. Come on up. Adults, come on up. Come on. Adults, be a good example for the children. Okay, so I want three of you to sit here, and three of you to sit there, and three of you to sit in the next row. Okay? Okay. Okay, wait. <laughs> this is great. I've got George, more than I down. need. Oh, come on. A few more up here, maybe. <laughs> come on up here, Lucas. There you go. Okay. Okay, so I'm a landowner, and... Oh, great. Come on. Here you go. Okay. So um, when I was living in Arizona, there were a lot of times where I saw people gathered, day laborers, who didn't have regular jobs, but they were very willing to work. And they would gather on a corner. Um, I've also seen it when the other town I was in in Arizona, they used to gather on the corner where the unemployment office was. So they would gather on the corner, and people would go by, that needed help for that day. Okay, so sometimes people don't have jobs all the time. They just work one day at a time. So I'm a landowner and I have this grape harvest that is ready to be picked today. Has to be done today because there's a big storm coming. And so I need a lot of laborers. So would you four be willing to pick grapes for me? Okay, I'm going to pay you $100 for the day. Okay, how's that sound? All right, okay, so you know what you need to do, and get to work. So then you get to work, 
and I go and do my stuff, my administrative work, and keep my, pay my bills and all those things, and then I come back, and it's like, oh my gosh, there's really a storm coming in, and there's still so many grapes to pick. I'm going to go see if I can get some more help. So I see that you're still here waiting for some work today. Would you work for me today? I've got some grapes that need to be picked. Okay, I promise I'll pay you a fair wage. Okay, all right, so, so they're going to help you. Okay, so now we've got eight people pick, working in the vineyard. So that's going to be $800 that I need to pay out, right, if you all got the same? But should they get the same? They're not working as long as you are. Well, let's see what happens. So there's still grapes to be picked. Still grapes to be picked. Come on, people, hurry it up, hurry it up. I think you need more, I think you need more work, more laborers to help you. Okay, so it's now almost dinner time and there's still grapes that need to be picked. Would you come and help them pick the grapes, the last of them? Okay, great, great. Okay, so we're at the end of the day and it's time for us to pay the workers. Okay, so the first people that got hired you're going to be paid last, so I have make sure I have plenty left over for you, okay? Okay, so this is for your work, and this is for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work today. Whoops, there you go. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and here's what I promised I would pay you too. Now, how much did I promise I would pay you? Do you remember what I said I would pay you? Okay, so you got $100. I never told them what I was going to pay them. I just said I would pay them a fair wage. Now, do you think they should have gotten $100 too? They didn't work as long as you did. In fact, those two in the back, they only worked for like an hour until dinner time. Do you think they should get the same amount of money? <laughs> no, they shouldn't, right? By our standards, they shouldn't. But by God's standards, God says, I love you all the same. God's grace is plenty for everyone, and everyone gets the same. Okay? So that's a very, one way to look at this parable. It's God's love and God's grace is the same for you. It's the same for you and the same for you. It doesn't matter when you say you love Jesus, doesn't matter what work you do because some people are, easy, are able to do more work than others. Some people get hired at different times. Some people don't get to know Jesus until late in their life, but God loves them just as much as the people who have been Christians forever and ever, okay? So let's take a moment to pray. Gracious God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for loving us so much that it doesn't matter who we are, how old we are, how young we are, or what gifts you've given us. You love us so much, just like the landowner who paid all his employees the same amount. Amen. Thanks a lot. Do you want to keep your $100 or you want to give it back? <laughs> it's not real. Sorry. Sorry. That would be nice, though. Thank you. <laughs> You can keep it, sure. So when the Secret Service shows up, because somebody's been copying $100 bills, <coughs> I'm going to direct them to you. All right, very good. So I think Craig is the reader. Are you the reader today? Is that right? Kathleen just told my whole story. This is the official version. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about 9 o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, 
You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this, I choose to give to the, this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. To God. Amen. Thank you, Craig. So as we get started, why don't we take a moment, let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to hear once again the gospel um, as Jesus preached it, as it's been given to us in the stories that he told. And we pray that as we think about this together this morning, that you might uh, surround us with your love and with your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start this morning with a video that I think is apropos to the story. So let's uh, take a look at this video that I happen to find. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, there's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. All right. Very good. <clears throat> All right. So what this video tells me is that we are supposed to hate this story. That's what the video tells me. We have evolved this way. We've been created this way. We are supposed to hate this story. There is a reason why when somebody cuts in front of us in line, we get angry about it. There is a reason why when, you know, a business kind of lures us in with this offer of a promotion and then we show up and we find out, well, we don't qualify for these various reasons. There's a reason why we get annoyed. And it proves to me, you know, this is just how we're made. 
we're supposed to be angry about unfairness. And that's just how it works. And God knows that if we had been part of that group that had been hired first thing in the morning, and that if we had only been paid the same amount as the people who showed up at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, God knows that we would have been on our phones, messaging our friends, either that or posting to Facebook some vague kind of thing, like, I love it when, blah, 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 you know, that kind of passive-aggressive thing where people say, oh no, what happened, right? But you don't answer, right? I hate that. But at the same time, I also know, and you also know, that if the shoe were on the other foot, in other words, if we had been the people who were hired late in the day and got paid the same as the people who got uh, hired very early in the morning, we also would tell that story because we like those kinds of stories too. You can't believe what this crazy guy did, right? We love those kinds of stories. You know, so long as it's not like, doesn't look like we're pulling the wool over on somebody, right? So that it's, it's kind of like, we got something that we didn't really deserve, but you know what, it was innocent and, you know, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time or, you know, whatever. It was a mistake on their part. We're perfectly happy with that. One of the best stories, and I swear to you, this is a true story. A guy I knew, actually a pastor that I knew, he went to a car dealership. And as he's going to the car dealership and working on buying this car, one of the salespeople who was working the floor looked at him <clears throat> and had just got done watching an America's Most Wanted and became convinced that this was the guy that he had seen on America's Most Wanted. He put in a call to the local police, and because he was on a federal list, it wasn't just the local police who responded. It was the state police, it was federal authorities, and they all descended on this car dealership. This was a horrible and humiliating experience. But the guy loved to tell the punchline. You know, I got a free car out of it, right? He loved that punchline. And the punchline of this story is, and so the first shall be last and the last will be first, which is actually something that repeats in chapter 19 and chapter 20. Both of these chapters kind of are illustrating this point, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. One of the things that's interesting about parables is the way that we interpret them often depends on the way that the gospel writer has set them in the story. So in other words, the events that are happening around help us to interpret the parable and vice versa, okay? So if you remember, one of the things I said about parables is it seems that they were usually told when Jesus was meeting resistance. And here the resistance that Jesus was getting in part was from the Pharisees, the Pharisees who are frequently people that Jesus argues with, who are absolutely determined that they are the first in everything, that they are absolutely the first in God's sight. But interestingly enough, it's not just the Pharisees. So when Jesus tells this parable and he talks about a vineyard, everybody around would have immediately known that he's talking about the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel. So it resonates with the Pharisees, but now also he's bringing it around to address his disciples as well. Because his disciples were not immune to thinking that they were the best. In fact, if you keep reading, what happens is James and John, actually James and John, their mother, comes to Jesus and they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. We want to be your left and your right hand. Other places you see where the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest among us, right? Jesus tells this story with the idea that his disciples need to hear it too. And this is the punchline. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now, this doesn't make us any more comfortable with the whole idea. Because we're still troubled by the fact that, well, the world ought to be fair. 
it ought to be fair. And part of fairness means that people should earn what they get. Would you agree with me? That we shouldn't just go around giving stuff out. That it's about what's fair, it's about what you've earned and what you've worked for. Now, especially those of us, you know, if we perceive ourselves as the ones who, by living right and showing up to church and saying our prayers, we perceive ourselves as the people who camped out the night before the Black Friday sale, right? That's how we see ourselves. We see ourselves at the front of the line at Best Buy on Black Friday. it would be greatly upsetting to us if the manager of the Best Buy would come out and say, I think, let's start back here. Let's start with these people. You come, come on, right? This troubles us. It troubles us to know that somewhere out there somewhere, there's someone who is getting something that they didn't deserve. That's deeply troubling to us. Isn't that what our whole immigration debate is about? That's deeply troubling to us. But there's a point in the parable that I think isn't real obvious unless you lived back in the day. But it's one that wouldn't have been lost on Jesus' original hearers. So did you notice who it is that goes out and does the hiring? It's, it's the vineyard owner, right? Well, in many other places in the scripture, Jesus talks about this in many of his stories. It wasn't <clears throat> typically the vineyard owner who was responsible for the day-to-day operations of the vineyard. If you own that much stuff, what do you do? You hire somebody to run it. And interestingly enough, there is a manager who's mentioned in this story. But this manager doesn't show up until the very end of the story, until it's time to actually pay out the wages. Otherwise, everything that happens, happens at the discretion of the vineyard owner. Now, why is that? Why is that? I think when we ask that question, we can start to hear this tick, 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 tick. Because this is where it's at. This is the heart of the story. So think about it for a moment. If you assume that the workday starts at 6 a.m. and runs till 6 p.m., that's basically the way that people worked in ancient Israel, the vineyard owner goes out at 6 o'clock, hires the first group. Now, presumably, the folks who are hired in the first group are among the best workers. What about the people that he goes back and hires at 9 o'clock? What do you think about them? Why are they still there? Well, they're probably still there because, no, you know, they're okay. But it's like, you know, maybe they're not the hardest workers, the fastest workers. Maybe they're not the smartest people hanging out on that corner. And then you take a step back from it and you say, well, okay, then he goes back at 12. So first of all, you're wondering kind of, You know, has this guy never been through a harvest season before? Does he not understand how many people he needs to hire? Like, why does he keep doing this? But imagine the people are hanging out at noon for a minute. Here's the picture that I get. The picture that I get of the people hanging out at noon. These are the guys who were out way too late the night before. And they're sleeping one off but they promised their wives that they would go out and look for work. That's what I picture. Do you think that's inaccurate? Now let's talk about the people who get hired at three or at five. Does it make any sense for anyone who's not absolutely desperate to still be hanging out on the corner at 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock, waiting for someone to hire them? Does it make any sense at all? Surely nobody's going to come by at 5 o'clock looking for somebody to hire, right? So what does that tell you about these folks? That tells you that these folks are absolutely desperate for the work. Why are they desperate for the work? Well, maybe they're not from around here. Maybe they have some sort of a, a disability There's probably some reason why. 
They haven't been hired. Now, what's interesting, again, is you come back to the idea then, why is it that the landowner is the one who's doing the hiring? Because the landowner knows that if he sends his manager out to do the hiring, these guys are never going to get hired. None of them. Because the manager has to look out for what doesn't belong to him. But the landowner says, it's mine, I can do with it whatever I want. And so the landowner is the one who takes this responsibility. The manager's got a certain set of values and those values include fairness, right? You can't pay somebody in grapes who's only worth cucumbers, right? Even monkeys know that. Everybody knows that. But remember, the way that Jesus introduces this parable is to say, this is a parable of the kingdom. If you remember, Kathleen talked about the idea of we can also introduce and maybe even more accurately talk about the kingdom as a kingdom. As the way that people live together when God is in control. And so the values of that kingdom are very different than our values. We're all about fairness. And in fact, it upsets us to think that the Lord of all the universe would not be fair. But there's another value that's even more important. And that value is compassion. The landowner comes and hires folks who otherwise would never be hired. And that's an intentional action. Now it upsets us because we feel like, well, you know, are they really worthy? Do they really deserve it? They haven't been working all that long. We lined up, you know, we, we camped out here overnight. But the values of this kingdom are very different than the values that we have. Thank God. What it's about is compassion. If it's about what we earned, then grace would not be grace, as Paul says. It has to be that which is given to us. That's what this kingdom is really about. And so when Jesus tells this story, he said, these are the landowner's values. When he tells this story, he says, these are my values. And when he shares this story with the people, he says, these ought to be your values. So the question is, are they? Let's pray together. God, we know that so frequently the thing that offends us the most is to see people receiving what they did not deserve. Remind us always that we too are the recipients of your grace. That it's only because of what you've done for us that we have been blessed with this life. That we live in you. And we pray that you might continue to use us for the building up of this kingdom. That you've created us for us here on earth. We pray that we might adopt your values. We love fairness but help us also to embrace compassion and grace. In your name, amen. So this morning we've heard you know, stories about God's generosity towards us, and now's our opportunity to uh, share what God has given us uh, to continue to build up God's kingdom here on earth through the church. And so let's offer to God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails Mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. And you stay. members of our prayer show ministry that would like to come up and, and stand in front of us and uh, be with us as we bless this prayer show. It comes to us, um, this is for Ivy, um, a friend of, or a relative of the um, Paines. So the young girl who's had some health challenging, challenges and doing much better now. You want to come up? So as we invite the Holy Spirit into um, this place and to bless this prayer shawl. Would you hold your hand this way? Just invite the, invite the Holy Spirit to work through you and through your prayers. 
Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for Ivy and for the joy that she brings to her family. We know that you've been with her through her health challenges and we know that you have been working through the medical teams to help her. So we pray that this prayer shawl might be a sign of your presence among us or from us and to her so that when she wraps herself in this prayer shawl, she feels our love she feels your love, and she feels the prayers that bring us all together. We give you thanks for those who are part of the prayer shawl ministry, and we give you thanks for the opportunity to share these prayers with those far and near. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So as we come into this time of, of prayer now, let's take a moment to settle ourselves and to center ourselves with our gracious and loving God. There will be opportunities as I'm praying for you to lift up names at one point or situations at another point that need a special attention from God today. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we do give you thanks for this glorious day, for this morning and the joy that has come to us through the bright sunlight, the cooler temperatures, and the opportunity to be gathered together to praise you. We know that there are those here and those connected to our congregation who especially are hurting this day, those who need you and need your comfort, need to hear our prayers, need to know that we're all connected. We think of, of Colin and Meredith who had to say goodbye to their fur baby, Kermit. And while pets may not be everyone's cup of tea, this is a doggy that was well-loved. And you know what it's like you know what it's like to lose a loved one. We think of those in hospital and those who are needing you this day, and we lift up their names now, aloud or in the silence of our hearts. You hear us. We pray for our United Methodist Church, and for your church around the world and the challenges that are facing the body of Christ, the challenges from society, the challenges even within our own midst. Among us, there are challenges, and so we ask for your guidance and your wisdom and your love and your grace to be with us so that we might all know that there's a place for each and every one of your children in this body of Christ. We pray for those around the world that need you this day, for, for those who are suffering from violence, those who are suffering from natural disasters, and those who just suffer with life in general. We lift up those names and those situations now to you aloud, or in the quietness of our hearts. We pray for Louise and for all those who need you, those who have been named and those who you know about, O oh God. Help us to be your people wherever we are. Help us to be your people to serve others to lift others up in prayer and to be your hands and your feet and your heart as you taught us through your son Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite you to stand with us. We're going to close, though, for a thousand. tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king the triumphs of if eloquence i could display in every language sing words could never say the praise I have for thee. Hallelujah. 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 All praise to our Every age with thousand times and thousand strong will praise his holy name. Hallelujah. 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 All praise to our God. Hallelujah. So as we go forth from this place, we go forth knowing that Christ has called us not to mere fairness, but to compassion and grace. Go forth to display and to share those values as you go out into the world. Go forth in the power, the grace, and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we do have to put the chairs up.